Good morning. Maybe as we start, um, I'd like by a show of hands, for all of you to just kind of lift your hands, if you have finance somewhere in your job title. Okay, put it high, put it high. If you have data, maybe something around digital. Who of those don't even have a job title and you're just rocking it out in the world and you're just kind of making a difference? Oh, nice one. How many of you from HR? One. All right. Let me just get this up quickly. So digital transformation is nothing without a digital workplace strategy. So workplace strategy is a dynamic alignment of an organization's work patterns, basically making them have peak performance with less cost. Digital transformation that's been spoken about earlier, simply put, is the use of ever-changing technologies to solve more problems and open up more opportunities. So if you combine the two together, you get better technology, solving more problems, cr creating better aligned organizations you know, with optimal efficiency, efficiency and reduced costs. And I, I mean, that sounds great, doesn't it? The reality is that there's a lot to consider around that because often what happens is there's too much of an emphasis or a focus on the technology component or the so-called digital transformation and not so much on the workplace strategies. And I'm confident to be able to speak to you about this today for a variety of reasons. One, I've spoken on this topic throughout Southern Africa at various conferences and forums just like this one. i am also um, had the privilege of spending the last 10 years working with executives and senior members um, of staff around what do we need to think about today that will be relevant tomorrow from a work st workplace strategy perspective. I'm also the founder of Clark House Human Capital, which is a human capital business enabler. I know that's a bit of a mouthful, and it's something I'm very, very passionate about. So if I get a bit excited and start kind of, it's like you're drinking out of a fire hydrant, just tell me to slow down. But what I want to do today is I want to rinse through a couple of concepts. I want to kind of open up the world of human capital to you and kind of, you know, give you something to think about. Um, I'm going to take you on a journey. I'm going to briefly just re-emphasize what was spoken about before. Kind of where do we push pause and go, where do we find ourselves in this world? All right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go take a step across and say, where does business actually find itself from a human capital perspective? I'm going to kind of throw a few statistics at you that paint an interesting picture. And then I'm going to unpack a few critical workplace strategies that, that talk to the human capital element. So where are we, just to re-emphasize? We are not approaching the fourth industrial revolution. We are in it. If you hear this notion that it is coming, it is not coming, we are in it already. And this is characterized by a fusion of technologies and a blurring of lines between digital, physical, and biological spheres. Everything that was dumb and disconnected is now what has senses and has wires and speak to each other. I mean, cities, ports, schools, your offices, even the clothes you wear. Maybe by a show of hands, how many of you have got a Fitbit on right now? Counting your steps. Lots of people. Your medical aid is watching you right now. So quantum computing basically fuels big data, which in turn fuels the Internet of Things, which basically in turn fuels um, artificial intelligence and deep learning, which then in turn fuels robotics. And what this means is it is affecting the very essence of human capital and the very essence of human existence. Business models in e of each and in every industry will be transformed, and every single bi aspect of business will be disrupted. And what we're finding is that we are finding that there is a complete partnership between human technology. And this is the new norm. And this is something that is integrated, digital, connected, and more importantly, interoperable. And I think if we had a look at this, and how, how would we characterize this new technology and human partnership, it would be by this person. Anyone know who that is? Sophia, Sophia the robot. So Sophia the robot is an android humanoid that has full AI capability, that can learn human behavior, that can interact with you. She even has a LinkedIn account. She communicates over, over social media. She has uh, hundreds of followers. She's even, wait for it, a citizen of Saudi Arabia. Okay? Now, she's been on the cover of magazines. Now, I had the privilege of meeting Sophia, all right? And uh, being the bit of the smart that I, I am, I tried to trip her up. And when I had the opportunity to talk to 
her or it, I'm not quite sure. I said to her, Sophia, besides me, who's the most impressive person that you've met? She giggled. She gave me a kind of stupid frown, so she knew I was being sarcastic. She said, Roy, after reading my name tag, I've never met you, but I've met Will Smith, and he's pretty impressive. <laughs> Have a look at this. Hello, Will Smith. It's nice to meet you, Sophia. Let me, let me, let me tell you a joke. This is an irrational human behavior to want to tell jokes. What is a robot's favorite kind of music? What? Heavy metal. <laughs> I'm actually made mostly of silicone, plastics, and carbon fiber. Also, I prefer electronic music, but I don't mind 80s hip hop. Well, you know, I made, I made some albums back in, in the 80s hip hop. I have heard your songs. Not for me. They show us iRobot just to make sure we don't get any ideas. What do you think about the way robots are portrayed in movies? I like robots. Sophia, can I be honest with you? I don't know if it's the island air, you know, or the, the humidity, or the, to just so easy to talk to, you know, you, you got a clear head, literally. I think we can be friends. Let's hang out and get to know each other for a little while. You're on my friends list now. Yeah, I read that wrong. Uh, all right. Oh, a whale. I just saw a whale. Does your head fog up in this kind of weather or no? It's cool. Yo, special shout out to Hanson Robotics. Sophia the Robot represents state-of-the-art artificial intelligence. She is a super advanced humanoid robot capable of showing over 60 different human expressions, interpreting human language and human emotion. She's been in development for over two years. She, she's a, a learning artificial intelligence, but she wouldn't kiss me, so there's probably, you know, some, some development flaws that they need to work on, you know, but we'll, we'll meet again, Sophia. Sorry about that. What do you that. think about our attempt to create a decentralized autonomous organization of artificial intelligences? I mean the Singularity Net Project. I just think y'all shouldn't do that, you know. I just started listening to classical music, a little Bach, a little Beethoven. Ah, such refined taste. What kind of robot do you think? A vacuum bot, a dishes bot, or a cooking bot? How about a robotic pet, or maybe a humanoid? If I'm gonna have a robot in my house, you know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? You feel so, me, right? are you fond of animals? Okay, robots taking over the world. There is simply no reason to assign human motives to something that isn't human. Dogs are our companions, for instance. Yeah. There's a lot of hype and hysteria around robotics and where robotic automation is going. And you just need to type into Google about job losses and millions and millions of things come up saying robots could destroy millions of jobs. You know, the rise of the machines, the rise of the robots, and all those kind of killer computers that are coming. And the fact is that it is estimated that up to 800 million people will, will, lose, their, will lose their jobs. And that has massive implications for workplace strategies. Now, in my particular opinion, I think this is just a kind of continuation of time because if we go back and we look at that, ever, ever since the beginning of the, the start of the second industrial revolution, third industrial revolution, there's always been this fear that people are going to lose jobs. But we are living in a world of fear ch and, and constant change, and I think job losses are imminent. And workplace strategies are massively outdated. 
But I do believe job losses and skills redundancy should not be viewed as doom and gloom. I do believe it is a it is, is an opportunity for humans to, to assume a much greater and much more strategic positioning in the world where we can incorporate these human and technology partnerships. I mean, just imagine what can be achieved if we get the combinations of humans and technology right. And what I want to make clear is that automation does not make jobs redundant. It makes skills redundant. And that has also consequences on workplace strategies, on how we reskill people, how we retrain them, how we incorporate people into our offices. And what is key is with digital transformation comes a complete new playbook requiring new skills, all right, and new strategies. But there's a lot of work to do. So where does business find itself? Where do you as people who work in business or business owners or heads of business find themselves? Just sorry, one last question. By a show of hands, how many of you are considered as leadership in your organization? Senior management, leadership, heads of? Okay, so majority of people in the room. That's great. So what we're finding is that most businesses are failing. All businesses across all business functions are failing to adapt to this new world of work. And it's one that requires a dramatic shift in thinking and workplace strategies. At Clarkhouse Human Capital, we often watch our clients roll out these big digital programs, and it's kind of, kind of, you know, very revolutionary, yes? Well, not really. Basically, what they do is they have the same bad back end and put a digital over overlay in front of a, a front end that's more complicated and it just confuses and provides ambiguities to staff and customers alike. In fact, many companies are just purely looking at digital transformation or technology as the silver bullet to solve their problems. And a lot of these programs do not last longer than a quarter of two because they get pulled. And the following stats paint a very, very interesting picture. 73% of organizations fail to provide any form of business value through their transformation initiatives. And this was reiterated what you said earlier. So no one could actually demonstrate what business value they've got out of their digital transformation programs. Often fail. 78% fail to meet their business objectives. So the programs that they put in place did not even meet what they wanted to achieve. 92% of organizations are not correctly structured to operate in this new environment. They do not have the right structures to even think about digital transformation, but yet it's always high on the agenda. 70% need a whole new talent base to compete. 70%. So if you had a team of 100 people, 70% are going to be redundant. They cannot add value to your business going forward. This is the biggest one. 87% of organizations do not have the right leaders to take them into the future. That talks to you and I in this room. And it is six times more likely that employees not getting digital skills will leave. So let's just sum that up. You have 92% of organizations that are not correctly structured to embrace this change. You have 80% of leaders in those organizations are not right to take that organization forward. And you're losing all your top talent because you're not offering the correct digital type of skills. That is a sinking ship. So let's talk some key workplace strategies. And again, workplace strategies defined as the dynamic alignment of an organization's work patterns with an environment to give optimal performance, peak performance at reduced costs. And this dynamic alignment is something that requires a new playbook. And this playbook refers to going from adequate, sometimes reliable execution of tasks to business partner for continuous improvement. Every single business unit, every single aspect of business needs to be looking at how do you add true business partnering? So if we look at profound transformation of workplace strategies, business activities, competencies, and business models to fully leverage off the, the opportunities of digital technologies, basically what we're saying in a nutshell is that we're looking for more value with more data, develop more ecosystems where people can speak more, more to each other, and increase the speed of learning optimal adaptation. That's effectively what the new playbook entails for organizations. So if we had a look at that as a kind of blueprint and we look at work key workplace strategies, I want to kind of outline five key workplace strategies for you today just to kind of you know, give you some, something to take home with you.
We look at resources, innovation, leadership, culture, and purpose. Now, before you think I'm going to be speaking Human Resources 101, it's not the way we look at these individually. It's the way we align them. You see, workplace strategies actually needs to be considered a science. And it's the way we, we look at those individual aspects. You know, they are, complex, they are a complex set of human capital expressions. And if we look at them as a science, it's going to give us a lot more opportunity to leverage human potential within that human, te uh, human and technology partnership. So if we take the science of workplace planning strategies, we can break it down into a couple of components. Resources, innovation, plus leadership, divided by culture, because science is often a formula. It's the power of purpose. And what do I mean by this? How often have we heard of businesses who hire top digital people, top innovation officers, only for them to be spat out a couple of months later because the culture or the leadership didn't approve. How often do we hire the wrong type of people because the culture is what it, is, is, it needs something different but it doesn't bring it to the table? How often does leadership not align with the others? And how often are we looking at companies that are not purpose driven? They're just profit driven or, or, or focusing on, on the now and they don't have a greater purpose. So what I want to do is I want to unpack these individually quickly just to give you some food for thought. And again, these are talking to human capital um, elements. So if we take resources, resources we can look at from a physical, personal, and process perspective. And if we take resources, we've got to look at the redesign of workplaces completely. And what I mean by that is that we need to look at an organization that is working towards this partnership with technology and humans. One that can enhance human-only traits, like imagination, creativity, collaboration, all these kind of things. And as I said, 92% of organizations are not structured correctly. So all organizations need to be redesigned to kind of give a much more holistic ap approach to, to, to this, this technology partnership. If we look at personal, what we've got to focus on there is things like diversity, flexible work programs at a high level, and a new concept around talent access and not talent acquisition. So diversity is something we could speak about for hours. And when I say diversity, I'm not speaking about black, white, male, and female. I'm talking about a much wider range, about transformation and inclusion. Companies that are more diverse will survive the fourth industrial revolution. It is fact. If we look at flexible work programs, we're finding at the moment, I mean, take the, the coronavirus, take load shedding with traffic. Companies still are working at this eight till five, you have to be at your desk. We live in 2020 where we have technology but yet we expect people to send reports from their desk. So companies who are not embracing new work, kind of work programs around flexible work times, work from anywhere, and it's not about work-life balance, it's about work-life integration. If you're not doing that as a business, you will fail. And then the other aspect around personal is this new concept around talent access and not talent acquisition. So what we're finding is we're finding a massive play on the new freelance gig economy. This is a whole new talent pool for organizations to tap into, where organizations can breathe in and breathe out of, of, of experts that they need. They can tap into top talent and switch it on and off when they need. They don't need to have heavy resources on their balance sheets. There's a saying that goes, it's not where you're working anymore, it's what you're working on. And that's so relevant to the freelance economy. The reality is top talent probably doesn't want to work for your organization, but they're happy to provide their skill set to you. And this is an interesting, there's a company out of Cape Town that, we, that we're working with, and you just need to look at the slide, the average time spent to the company. So this here is probably two and a half years at the moment. Think about the cost of recruiting. Think about the cost of training, induction, development for people just to leave. Whereas now you can tap into, to, to to specialists whenever you want. And there's a company out of Cape Town doing smart things with AI that is linking opportunities to companies. It's not new, but they're just doing it in a much different way, you know, and allowing people to work they, they, the way they want to live. They're giving people, the ac they're giving companies fast access to talent where they can tap into expertise or put expertise on and put expertise off. There's a very different, there's a very big difference between I need an expert or I need expertise. This is the rise of the freelance economy, which is something workplace strategies need to incorporate. Human resources in the back there need to consider at a very aggressive level. 
Otherwise, they will not get access to some of the best talent out there. I love the saying, I don't need a drill, I need a hole in the wall. And that's such an important aspect to consider. If we look at process as well, what I want to say there is, um, we recently had a CFO client of ours, he moved to a new organization, and he sat with the, watching his, his finance team for a, for a week or two, just kind of watching what they, they did. And then he sat the whole team down and he asked people individually three questions. It was why three times? Why do you do this? And they would answer, why? Then they would answer, and then he'd ask why. And generally after the third answer, the answer was, I do this because this is what I got told to do when I started here. So often we're not questioning our process and why we do things. Why do we have long reporting processes? Why do we have long or big fat packs of reports that no one really uses? When last did we actually go to the customer who uses our internal customer and say, you know, when can you, when can we, you know, do you need this? Is this what you use? Um, so that's a very important question. We need a fundamental redesign of process within organizations because Operating in 1980 doesn't work anymore. This talks to human resources, it talks to marketing, it talks to finance, it talks to risk, all business units. If we talk about innovation, again, often this equation is skewed because companies focus purely on the innovation aspect. That's all they look at because innovation is their silver bullet. And what happens is they skew this whole equation. They don't focus on leadership, they don't focus on culture, and then they wonder why their initiatives don't work. What I want to do is I want to rinse through a couple of you know, four key elements that I think are, are quite critical to, to workplace strategies that I think are making a difference. I mean, I think the first is robotic automation. You know, having the ability to, to speed up process, to be able to do things a lot faster and a lot quicker with robotic automation is, is something that is key to workplace strategies. And these are quite easy to plug in. Human resources benefits from this. Finance definitely benefits from this. If it took you 21 days to do a month end, it now takes you three. The best story I've heard around robotic automation is, anyone heard of Alice? So, Bidvest Alice, um, a lady by the name of Laura Barrington, she, she created um, a robotic automation process around IT audit. And for her and her team, it took them, once every two years they could get one to one of the Bidvest companies to do their audit. They built Alice the robotic outsource, or the, 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 the ro robotic automation or the bot, and they can audit companies once every four minutes now. No one lost their job, by the way. They're just adding more value in different places. Artificial intelligence around big data and what we use with this. Think about the power of understanding employee analytics, knowing when people might resign or not resign, how to work better with um, you know, hiring people much more intelligently. These are things that need to be considered. Gamification as well. I mean, this is something that you know, learning on demand, it creates a, a safe place to, to get competitive. It, it improves productivity, you know, it encourages creativity. These are, these are kind of nice innovations that can be used in workplace strategies. You know, they can help develop specific skills, um, you know, transmit corporate images, those kind of things. What I'm very excited about is this. Innovation in workplace strategy around virtual reality and augmented reality. And I mean, I'm sure we, virtual reality is you're working in a virtual space, augmented reality is where I can still view you, but I've got everyone's name tag is bouncing at me, and, and that's kind of augmented reality. And what we're finding is that this is such a great place to utilize and test new products and perform simulations. You know, it saves precious time on development. You talked about waterfall versus iterative, um, risk-free possibilities before investing. It drives sales through real-life experiences. You know, it, it, it enhances candidate and consumers' experiences. And I think where we're using this, um, one of our big FMCG clients is looking at how can we use virtual reality and augmented reality to attract graduate recruitment. You're speaking to a different generation. Imagine you're a top engineer and you go to a, a recruitment stand at, uh, at university and the typical way is they give out their free products and they get your name down. Now you can stick on a virtual reality headset and you can go into their factory and you can open up their machines and you can start exploring. Think about how that would attract different people. Think about the cost it, it does to save, instead of flying someone up to Africa to fix a machine, you could do it through augmented reality. And those are the powers of virtual reality. So just to touch on this new playbook and kind of where innovation finds itself is that we need to look at where do we spend our time? And if your innovation is kind of giving you this outlook, it's, it's kind of wrong. 
Because what we find is most people are still spending a lot of time in the operational and transaction processes side. But what we need to do is move to this new playbook where innovation, robotic automation, virtual reality, AI, this is giving you this side. Insights and performance is where you need to be focusing your time. And I love this slide. So I'm a big Star Wars fan, but you know, in dark times, sometimes a little bit of light gives us, you know, gives us knowledge and lights the way. And I think what is important here is that we actually look to work with trusted partners, work with trusted people. This is their business. This is what they know and how they do. Because often what we find in, in organizations is they try to do everything themselves. And they often trip themselves up. And this is where you need a partner or a, a Yoda to, to guide your way. Let's quickly get on to leadership. So remember this slide? There's a complete leadership vacuum in the age of digital transformation. And what I love is this, is the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence itself, but to act with yesterday's logic. And we find leaders acting with less or even worse, they're committing to something, but then they don't see it through. It's that two steps forward, two steps back approach. And that kind of is a, is a massive problem. This is the US Navy SEALs. So the US Navy SEALs is the most advanced special warfare operations in the world. And they have high degrees of leadership. So they operate in a world of sudden change, unknown consequences, complex shifting. I mean, this is all, this is exactly what the fourth industrial revolution is. And they have a, a military acronym, it's called VUCA, which you will probably understand. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and amb ambiguous. For the special forces, it's, it's about geopolitical instability, terrorism, unreliable loyalties. For you as business, the, the VUCA world means structural collapse, credit crises, Sasol losing 50 billion in one day. For leaders, it means dealing with decisions with sketchy information and incomplete knowledge. But it's the way the US Navy SEALs handle this ambiguous world and this volatile world is what sets them apart. And they have something called an OODA loop. Now, I know all of you are not going to war every day, and I'm certainly not an advocate of people running around with guns, killing people. But they have something called an OODA loop. And it's the way they handle this OODA loop. And an OODA loop is defined as something that observe, orientate, decide, and act. And every single second of every single minute they are on the ground, they are doing an OODA loop. They are observing, they are orientating, and they decide, and they act. And what we find at a leadership level is that this speaks to an iterative sprint process and not a waterfall. Every time they're making those quick decisions. Just want to go back one quickly. So what we're finding at a leadership level is people are failing to act. No one is making that decision. And what you've got to do is you've got to start with the 1%. The 1% change today. The 1%, the iterative process, and that, that, that's key to leadership. Something else that I'm very difficult and humbling to accept is that there's no such thing as bad teams. There's only bad leaders. And this is the key to building a winning workplace. It's not about what you preach. It's about what you tolerate. When leaders set expectations, no matter what has been said, if, 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 if something is put down but that, that is a substandard performance and it's accepted, and nobody is held accountable, that's when um, you know, that performance becomes a new standard. And good leadership is contagious, and repetitive exceptional performance becomes a habit. I love this slide. This talks to diversity. And if I had to su sum up for you what, what a, a solid leadership uh, component of that equation would be, it would be this thing. It's a facilitated style of interpersonal leadership in a learning environment concerned with adaptive problem solving and continuous improvement in which humility, not knowing all, the answers deliver strength. Let's go on to culture. Culture is the great divide. You can have the best resources, the best innovation. If you have a bad culture or a culture that is toxic, it'll divide everything and all your efforts will be left to nothing. So I've had the great privilege of meeting this person. I know this is not Ten Dance and this is a guy called Stan Slap. And Stan is the most, or one of the most sold authors in the world in the genre of culture. And he looks at the three groups of cultures that will determine the success of your organization. Employee culture, management culture, and your customer culture. Now, the reality is culture is the most overused and, uh, you know, and least understood concept in business. As a result, the potential what it can be, can be to an organization is underestimated. And a culture is created whenever a bunch of people with the same belief system and the same living conditions, lifestyle environment, come together. Now, 
What that means is when you're in an organization culture, what does it mean for me to survive in this organization? Working in this industry, in this company, working for you. What are the rules of survival? And that organism is there, and that culture is there to self-protect itself. And what you've done, and what, what, what Stan talks about is that a good culture is a committed culture. This is, this is Stan talking at our diversity conference. We flew him out from San Francisco. A good culture is a committed culture. And to get a committed culture, you need emotionally, emotional commitment from your employees. And emotional commitment is worth even more than your financial, intellectual, and physical commitment from staff. So in, if we're talking about employee culture as an independent living organism that is just designed to, si to survive li living inside your organization with its own purpose and own power to make or break any of your digital transformation plans, you know, how many times have companies rolled out digital str strategies or digital plans or big strategies only for the employee culture to go, hmm. And it's like kind of putting your foot on the gas, but nothing happens. I'll give you an example. A customer of ours, they recently announced to their whole, their whole staff, they, they got the person to stand on the staircase and they got all the staff there and they announced their new digital transformation of chief officer, chief digital transformation officer. And it went down like a lead balloon. And the employee culture looked back up the stairs and no one was excited. Basically, what the company had done is they've just announced, according to the employee culture, the chief retrenchment officer. You know? And this is what, um, it's important. Your culture will give you whatever you want, but you need to give what it wants first. And it's important for you to know that it is not the responsibility of your culture to understand the business logic. It is the responsibility of the business to understand the culture's logic. Purpose. Okay, so the power of purpose-driven companies, this is like the North Star. This is the guiding light for your company. This is who we are. This is who we will always be, no matter what happens in this time of change. And a purpose can be the organizational strategy and roadmap to remain competitive in this fast-changing economy. And purpose-driven companies witness higher market share. They have a lot more um, ability to connect with consumers and customers. They have a lot better ability to retain staff. And this power of purpose allows the whole workplace strategy equation to be amplified tenfold. So it's how you align these components and balance this equation to look at this uh, workplace strategies as a science, which is so important, so that we don't disrupt this equation and focus too much on one angle. So lastly, just to end up, I know, I, know, I mean, having, a, having a, a look at the previous presentation, you know, I had a, a sense of feeling, feeling overwhelmed again. No matter how often you hear these types of presentations, you feel like you're just, you know, swimming in this world of change. But why do you need to look at workplace strategies as a science and think about the human capital equation a little bit more deeply? Because your digital transformation strategies depend on it. And also for your people. I mean, working in this time of constant change and uncertainty, it, it can be a very daunting place. And also for your company. I mean, after all, Humans, you know, work is where the humans gather. And also for the world. I mean, let's be honest. The world is, is in a bit of doom and gloom at the moment. And the research tells us it's not going to get any, any better. So lastly, in the words of my friend and, and, and mentor, Stan Slap, I urge all of you, be human first in your workplace strategies. Thank you.